By the time the 1990s got into full swing, Zenith or Zenith Data Systems, still owned by Group Bol, were undergoing some turmoil within the company, especially with finances, and management was changing around. But they were still making laptops. Did the magic from their earlier models carry over into this time, or was it already gone? Well, hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and I guess we'll find out a little bit today with the Xena 325, or something like that. Branding on mine's a little bit off, and we'll see why soon enough. It's not like it's a knockoff or something, it'll all become apparent, and some of you might already know, because I, I have another one, that's sort of, with the same deal going on. Um, yeah, well, there's no point in me using up all our time on that, so... Well, let's just uh, get on with this, and I'll come back at the end. I've got a few things to talk about. Uh, nothing we don't already know, in all likelihood, but... Yeah, whatever. Get on with it. Get it done. Well, it's very square. But apparently it's hip to be square, according to a crappy 80s song that makes me want to punch people. So let's forget about that. In all honesty, this probably isn't a million miles away from something I would design, at least aesthetically, but not on a laptop, where I'd more than likely replace those squares with lines featuring diagonals on the top somewhere. It does look pretty nice and very much of its time, but those squares are nearly impossible to clean which isn't a great design for a thing you're going to be putting your hands all over on a regular basis. I mean, think about it. You don't make fuck toys that way, do you? And anyone who's earned one of those will tell you that it sure does pick up dirt from your hands quickly, but they're quite easy to clean because they're usually a smooth surface. This thing, though, your management tool, your business tool, whatever you want to call it, the designer didn't think this through. That's a very quick indicator that this is a departure from Zenith's old design principles. This thing just attracts dirt. So watch as it slowly sullies over the course of filming this video. There's not really anything at the front of the machine. On the right there's a floppy drive that doesn't work. More on that later. I mean, it's a floppy drive, of course it doesn't work, but still, more on that later. There's also this weird modem port that I'm not sure why it's like that, as the whole modem could fit on a card the size of the one in here. It did on the Slim Sport already and in various Toshiba machines, so they could have just done that and put a regular RJ11 on it. It feels like an attempt to needlessly sell accessories, which is horrible, and I condemn it. That trend continues with the LAN port next to it. Best guess is an AUI dongle of some sort hung off it, more than likely akin to the ones used by the DE660 and countless other PCI MCIA cards. PCMCIA? Ah, oh, man. Well, anyway, yeah, d different connector here, obviously. All the parts that are required seem to otherwise exist on the peripheral board in the machine, so. We'll see that soon, and yeah, probably another unnecessary component. There would have been plenty of room to just have the sockets on the machine. On the left, there's a hole for a battery. Annoyingly, when this is not installed, there's an even larger hole in the bottom of the machine. Not really ideal for resting it on your lap, but hey, that's what we were given. We've got all these hard edges all over the place. It's honestly quite a hostile feeling to this thing so far. The only other thing on this side is a rather awkward lock hole. This thing is not packed with very many features, it seems. At the back then, we've got VGA. We've also got what I assume is for an expansion chassis. I don't have a manual, and there's a missing dust cover, so I'm guessing. There's also a PS2 port, which is very heavily used. That thing is, yeah, pretty had. There's parallel there, and serial. Gone are the days when you could just use a barrel plug, and now we have this fucking thing. Absolutely disgusting. I do not like laptops that require a brick but use weird unique connectors when it's not necessary. There are also multiple voltages which use this connector type, so beware of that if you're working with these because you could end up with the wrong one and either have a laptop that doesn't run stably or just barns up. I can run only with the brick, as the battery pack leaks, and I'm not sure if they're lithium, 
or something else. If there were NICAD, I'd have considered repairing it, but if there were NICAD, I would also be surprised if they were broken, and it doesn't really feel heavy enough. You know, I do really like this version of Zenith's logo, though. I've, I've always found that quite appealing. There's just something about that green against that blue. It's quite striking. It might have been apparent from the top that said logo was supposed to be in this blank, as far as I'm aware, but it's not featured on this laptop, because if we look underneath, we'll find that the label brands this as a BT laptop, British Telecom. A Note 325L, made in early 1992. Despite being the fourth version, allegedly, this suggests it's quite an early unit. It also reveals the CPU, in a way. It's made in Nihon. Warranty labels all over the place. I very much dislike this. I was the first to pop their cherry, and gone are the days of Zenith telling you what was in the machine in great detail, and pretty much encouraging fiddling about in there. That's gone. Don't go in there. Warranty's void. Flip in the lid, well, we can see a fairly standard setup for the time, with the keyboard right against the front and a screen that doesn't quite reach the edges. Also, another square, while well, there would have been a logo that just isn't on this one, because, like we say, it's a BT machine, I guess they didn't want to pay to put their logos there. What, what use is it to their engineers to star at the logo of the company they work for, right? The keyboard is damn weird. I can't think of anything comparable to it. It's definitely a strange thing, because it really feels like it's probably a derm keyboard, but it's extremely stiff. Far stiffer than one of those stupid clickety-clack ones, even. Those things that people who pretend they like computers tend to use. You have to press hard, and the travel is all kinds of wrong feeling. It's... yeah. About the closest thing I can conceive of is if you took a TV remote and glued keycaps to it, or maybe you did that with a ZX Spectrum, but this is even worse. It doesn't feel like an actual derm derm under there. It, it's almost certainly some sort of rubber, but maybe it's a zebra strip. Y you know, mm, I'm tempted to take it to bits, because it, it's... Yeah, Yamaha keyboards from the 80s, very similar feeling. They're not as stiff, but those used a zebra strip, some of them, and that's, that's what it reminds me of, but worse. Goes without saying, I don't really like this, and tend to make typing mistakes quite regularly on it. It just doesn't feel right in your hands, even without that strange stiffness. It's worse than the T6600C, and the keyboard on that thing was just ghastly, to be honest. Not sure if it's as bad as the Dolch was, but it can't be too far off, for different reasons. Yeah, those, I think this and that rank the highest for the worst keyboard on a machine I've had on this channel. You know, some Soviet keyboards felt a bit like this, but they were actually better. Those aren't too bad to use, but it was a very similar feeling. It was like this feeling, but not crap. Behind that keyboard is a LCD that takes the place of LEDs for status indicators. This isn't the only lap to do it, and I doubt it's the first. I wonder which was. I don't like it, because you can't see this in the dark at all. It's not backlit, and it'd be distracting if it was. So you have to properly look at the screen to see which indicator is on, and at the right angle, because the viewing angle on it isn't fantastic. LEDs are simply a better way of doing this, especially if they have symbols. Oddly, that seemed to be a 90s thing. As every laptop I see now has gone back to the 80s idea of just square or round windows of light with labels nearby, and they're usually all white or all blue, so you don't even have the colour to go on. Notice how on the Armada from the late 1990s, we had what were essentially illuminating symbols, so that you could actually track this in your periphery without looking away from the screen. The same is true of the mid-90s satellite I have. A lot goes into designing a product well, and usability is important. At the end of the day, this is a machine that primarily interfaces with a human being, and you want to make that process as comfortable and as efficient as possible. Every laptop that tried this status LCD rubbish completely dropped the ball on that concept. It was a stupid idea, and I hoped it would never come back, but I seem to think Apple tried reviving it a few years ago, but then, as I'm sure we all know, there are a bunch of fucking morons, and Control 
what was it, 2% or less of the market. So I'm sure everybody will copy them because that's how you work a winning product is you copy a product that can't gain any market share rather than one that has a third of it, right? We'll come back to a product that earns like a third of the laptop market. Sort of, in a way, I think. Yeah. Anyway, just give me a hard disk symbol and a floppy symbol that light up and I'm good, thanks. I don't need this thing, and I don't understand why they wanted to do it. LEDs were very inexpensive, extremely hard wiring, and they lasted a really fucking long time. There was no excuse for this deviation from an established norm that was proven to work from the start. There's a door here that lets you get to the weird RAM modules, I'll forgive them for being strange because I don't think there was really a standard yet, and the FPU. Well, at least they're letting us do some things with that without violating the warranty. Or else the label came off years ago, which is a possibility for, well, reasons we'll get to. I, this RAM is 2 megs. There's another 2 megs built into the machine. It's actually quite a good capacity for the time, but I don't like RAM being soldered to motherboards, because if it breaks, you're pretty much either using tools that cost four figures or just chucking the machine away and guess which one I'm gonna do. I mean the laptop's not even worth 30 quid as far as I know so in the mid it'll go if that ever happens. Still it's certainly an adequate amount of RAM, more than adequate actually, to run most things in 92. I'd like another module but not enough to have really looked for one. Don't car that much. Also, the door likes to come open when you're using the laptop, as it doesn't clip in very well. It's pretty much just held in there by a bit of friction and gravity. If there was warranty label on it, it'd keep it in place. <laughs> so I sort of wonder if there was one there, and they're just, oh, no one will notice. Usability isn't a strength of this machine at all, though, because where all the Zeniths tended to have all those nice slopes and calves, making it clear the engineer had actually used the laptop and probably wanted to use the thing he was designing, or at least that's how he was looking at it, this thing is just squares, and it's really uncomfortable to use for any length of time. The edges make my hand hurt where they rest against it, and the corners make my legs hurt on the underside, so especially where that battery compartment is, that is such a hard angle. It isn't a very heavy machine though, in fact it might just be the lightest laptop I've ever held, though this comes out of cost. Where the older Zenith used thick plastic that was really strong, this one flexes around when you pick it up or touch it and the whole chassis has sagged and burred over the yards. Nothing's really quite the right shape anymore. Surprising the screen hooks are still metal. I would have thought making those plastic would get rid of a bit of weight, but we probably shouldn't encourage them then again. It's a bit late now. Do laptops even still have these? Shit as it is to do it, I'm going to take the risk and void my warranty to open this thing up. I hope you appreciate what I'm doing for you here. This could leave me out of pocket. Screws are hidden in a few places, like in the battery compartment under the FPU door, and the RAM also has to be unscrewed. This is very Japanese feeling. With the plastic being as flimsy as it is, you'd better not miss one, or else something probably is going to snap when you try and separate the two halves of the chassis. I've no idea why there's a hole to one of the keyboard screws in the RAM compartment. There's long ones that work in here due to the head being too big for the hole, and they're still too short. Maybe this is like that screw on my Elite Book that prevents the bottom cover from going on. Like, what the fuck is that for, and what idiot put it there? I, I don't understand. In any case, I'm getting fuck the repair man vibes from this, and I very, very strongly dislike that whoever did this is a fucking retard. This is in stark contrast to all the Zenith equipment, which was very friendly to the repair man. This feels more Japanese than American, and I have to wonder how much of the design was outsourced to them. Japanese computers invariably piss me off with all their non-standard crap and their insistence on being awkward for no reason other than being awkward and being able to say, this is ours, and they're only ours, and fuck you. Japan is basically like Apple, let's be honest, when it comes to building computers. They've never been very good at it either, so... I don't know why they'd go so far to do this. If I was them, I would just copy everybody else. It's weird, because they're really good at building optical drives and stuff, so I don't know why they struggle with this. In any case, there. 
the internals, they're quite compact. The CMOS battery leaked all over and it got all over as they just tucked it in uh, the floppy drive rather than putting it in its own leak proof compartment which was accessible to the user as in how they did it on the Slim Sport in the 80s. So we've gone a few steps backwards here, haven't we? I thought this was what had killed the floppy drive but I suspect it never worked in the first place and we will get there as I keep saying. For now, we consider the CPU. It's a 386SL running at 25 MHz. These are much like the 386SX, but they're lower power. The 387SL runs at only 20 MHz for some reason, which is odd. I mean, I'm pretty sure the 25 and 33 were out by the time this thing arrived, but maybe I'm wrong. For some reason, I misremembered it as being a 386EX in this computer, a CPU from 1994 that's quite interesting in its own right, for nothing else than it having a 26-bit wide bus and being Intel's last embedded CPU until a good way in the 2000s, even though 386EXs went into space. I wonder if any laptops use them, because it would have been a good CPU for a laptop, although by 94 would have maybe been a bit lacking. Yeah. Akai samplers use them, I believe, at some point. My 3200 doesn't, but I think there was something in the S series that did. One nice thing with the processor is this 386SL has an external cache that should speed it up. I cannot get a clear answer on the amount. I think it's 4K. You can see the SRAM there and the onboard DRAM nearby. This is a double-sided board, so we'll have to flip it over to look at the other side. Dismantling this thing's a bit of a pain, but it's far from the worst laptop to work on. It isn't Toshiba levels of annoying, but it's still a bitch, although you can at least get into this thing, unlike that Dolce Portable I had where, well, it was pretty much a one-way process, and the only way to get in there was to destroy it. And there we go. All the serial and parallel and such is on this board built into that big Intel QFP. This is like the yin to the yang of the 386SL. It's almost like the 82206 on steroids and probably less prone to failure. I can't tell you how many boards I've lost to those now. Contains almost everything barring the CPU that you'd need for a fully functioning PC. It's like a system on two chips almost. I suppose underneath this thing is essentially a 286 platform which was clocking on for a decade old by now, so it was pretty mature and, well, they should have known how to make it well and highly integrated, evidently they did. Curiously, the data sheet for that chip mentions an Intel VGA solution in passing, which is... I didn't know there was one that long ago. Oh, that reminds me, the screen has an unused header next to it, cable there. That's probably for driving a colour panel. I considered installing a colour panel, but they cost more than a brand new laptop, as in a few hundred quid for a bar panel. And given how scummy LCD makers are now, it'll probably be worse quality than this old passive monochrome display. I mean, we've seen what modern LCDs are like. The response time and the, the sharpness and, you know, contrast and everything on them is just awful. They just lie in the data sheets, and they're quite happy to do it. I don't know when this became acceptable, but you can see from the 2000s onwards, LCDs have gotten worse on quality and pixel densities. Peculiar. People keep buying them though, because they're all morons, and that means the company will keep doing it. The screen is also one of the only things with actual wires in here. The rest of the machine is being overtaken with the cancer of polyamide ribbons that persists to this day. I really, really hate these things. Once they're gone, they're gone, and the machine's dead, because Lord knows what size they are, and try ordering more, and well, if they're hardwired to the board, it's game over. Below the top board, then, is what I call the peripheral board. This has the circuitry that enables that display. For VGA, we have a Cirrus Logic 6410. This chip should be about on par with a Paradise speed-wise, which is not the fastest, but it's more than enough for a 386. And it's really a lot more capable than you might think it is. For one thing, it can do scaling, and I've yet to find anything that it can't scale to the size of the screen, which is pretty impressive. 
For another, it is completely capable of simul scan, driving both the internal and external display at the same time with differing parameters. By the mid-2010s, there were still very many laptops which lacked these features or did not implement them well. So I have to commend this one for actually doing it as well as it did. This display solution from Cirrus is actually really, really good. Even the REM deck is internal, albeit limited only to 8-bit colour, but you're not really going to push any harder than that on a 386SX type machine, are you? I mean, you could, but that would be a very, very niche application. It's not going to run very well. It really is an impressive little chip here, and it definitely shows how far behind certain vendors had fallen. I'm looking at you, Seng Labs, with your need for multiple ICs. This is why Cirrus lived considerably longer in the graphics market and still exists elsewhere today. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that said, I don't think this Cirrus has much in the way of acceleration or anything on it. Likely little if any VBE either. It's not going to matter on this computer, but it's worth bearing in mind if you encounter one on a later laptop where you'd expect more capabilities. This chip here seems to have my writing on it, whatever it is and whatever it does. You know, there's quite a few bodges in this thing. You've got all these revisions in and we're still doing this. I'm... Mm, it just doesn't give me the quality vibes. The quality goes in before the name goes on, but what sort of quality are you putting in here? Because it... I don't know. Not much else down here outside of the ID adapter. Uh, floppy stuff and charge circuit. It's far more complicated than the old regulator resistor setup, which farther makes me think it doesn't use NICADs. You know, NICADs get a really bad name these days, but that's just dumbassery and propaganda. If you think NICAD batteries are done, I'm honestly not going to be embarrassed to call you a fucking idiot. I mean, look at this. NICAD still holds charge. Hasn't leaked yet. NICAD still holds charge. Hasn't leaked yet. NICAD still holds charge. Hasn't leaked yet. NICAD still holds charge, hasn't leaked yet, it's 38 fucking years old. Unknown, leaks like hell, doesn't charge. This brand new battery technology they thought was going to be their saving fucking grace. Lithium, that doesn't charge. Lithium, barely holds charge, not even five years old. Lithium, bulging, unable to charge. It's probably going to explode. NICADs pretty much never explode, but hey, let's all just have this lithium polymer shit in our house that's known to spontaneously combust. I'm sure that won't be a problem. I mean, you know, I'll ask Samsung about that, I guess. Uh, that said, this is lithium iron. It charges, doesn't leak. But the internal discharge is a far bit faster than it was 25 years ago which just can't be said of those older NICAD packs. I don't deny that there probably were bad NICADs out there, but I can't say I've had that many problems with them. I, I think there's been a whole fucking load of shit sewn here to make people go off them and not miss them. It's... I don't know. Something's not right. Now, that floppy drive. That's busted. You know why? Because that screw on the far side's too long and jams the mechanism. It'd be easy to blame a previous repairman for putting the wrong screw in, but remember that I broke the warranty seal. So these are the original screws in the place they came from Sanyo or Zenith, whoever made it. Chances are this drive never worked then, and the mechanism was damaged at the factory by this screw. As even with this screw removed, the mechanism doesn't actuate due to the mechanism being bent by said screw and preventing its travel. The quality goes in before the name goes on. Yeah, like a screw right through a bloody floppy disk drive mechanism. You fucking idiots! There's a really quiet PC speaker under the floppy drive. PIT sounds only on this thing. There's, like, no PCM or FM, nothing like that. You might as well just not bother with that. You, you can barely hear it. The only thing it's really comparable to is the T1200XE, and that might actually be a little bit louder. The dodgy screw stuff continues when we try to reassemble the computer. I knew there was something fishy going on when I was taking it apart, and we end up a few screws short, as in, we've got more holes than we have screws. Also, there's multiple lengths and different head sizes. It, 
just seems like a trap to detect if somebody's tampered with the machine. Like, if you retard it under warranty, they'd go through every screw meticulous. Like, oh, this one's not how we do them from the factory. Your warranty's invalid. That, or, again, it could just be an error from the factory. Maybe it's not intentional that it's missing screws from the factory. It's weird, because some aspects of the design, like the monitor cable and the jumpers, make it look like DNA from the old designers that were friendly to the power user. But so much of it is just user hostile. You might think I'm being harsh on this, but at the end of the day, you know, if something goes wrong in one of these, it's me who has to fix it, and I don't appreciate this hostility being thrown at me for trying to keep the thing you made and made poorly in running order that there's just no need for it you're a prick and i'm not going to be nice to you or the thing you designed you don't deserve that you do not deserve my car to see if you're out there whoever whoever it is fuck you oh the hard disk that was a connor so of course it died and so i have a flash card in here now doesn't really matter Let's just start the bastard. It takes forever to actually turn on. Uh, weirdly, that standby switch there really doesn't look like it should get pressed by the screen lid coming down, so I have to imagine it's just barely on when the lid is down. It all looks a bit bent up here, warped by age and just general sort of flimsiness. Uh, date entry. Well, you can't input a date past sort of 1998, so yeah, it'll just beep angrily. This thing wasn't meant to last very long, was it? A six year lifespan tops. Guess there's none of that it'll outlive you spirit of the old super sport left, is there? Sometimes you totally can put a date in in the 2020s though, so I don't know what flag determines this. It seems to be completely random. Maybe it works fine if you have the CMOS battery in. I, I don't. It's MS-DOS. I won't spend long showing you as finding an angle to both film and view the screen is pretty difficult. Speed-wise, we'll get 7.6 in 3D bench, 1.7 in PC player, 44 in top bench. It looks normal in speed, sis. Uh, can't do many tests in that, not enough RAM. With scaling on or the external display enabled, the numbers change. I had scaling on when I recorded, but not when I wrote the numbers down, so you might be seeing a discrepancy here. Peculiarly, it is actually faster to use the internal display, unlike earlier machines where that tended to slow things down. Strange. I wonder what that's about. In any case, performance-wise, it is fast enough. It's, it's not bad. I mean, it is pretty damn fast. Wolf 3D is mostly playable on this. It runs fairly smoothly. Nightmare 3D also. Obviously, 2D games work quite well. You should have no problems with those. You will have to put up with the passive display. It's one of the absolute best passive screens I've seen, though. It does ghost and lag and streak, as all passive matrix displays of this size will, but... It does so far less than most, and while it won't show on the camera too well, even the contrast is nice when it finally stabilises. The slider pots are a little bit darty, and I really can't be bothered to do anything about it. Part of the screen's quality comes from the way it works. We've seen 640x480 DSTN split into two 640x240 tiles before, as with the Slim Sport. This one splits it into four columns and two rows of 160 by 240 tiles each. Streaks will only run to the edges of a given tile, so this does clean the picture up quite a lot. It's more effective than you'd think. You know, this thing gives me weird vibes, like I know it from somewhere. The, the whole laptop is just... weirdly familiar. Have you clocked what we're looking at yet? In late 1992, several months after the Note 325 appeared, IBM introduced the ThinkPad line. With it, the ThinkPad 300. This model was a rebranded Zenith. It looks damn similar, doesn't it? Same specs as this machine. So what we have here is almost a proto ThinkPad. Even the keyboard seems to be the same. 
could it be that the crappy HIDs that have plagued the ThinkPad line since their introduction around that time are in some part a remnant of this thing? Have we found the origin? It would make sense. You know, I wouldn't have thought IBM would play with it that much. IBM just never figured out how to do the whole human interface thing, which is pretty funny given other people who came up with the PC in the first place. People ridicule me for saying this, but just go read 80s literature. It's fucking hilarious how everybody hated those big clicky-clacky keyboards the IBM PC used to come with. It was just a known thing. That was garbage. And they didn't put them on the ThinkPad, they just put different crappy things on that. Still, speaking of keyboards, the LCD has many contrast modes rather than just inverse and normal. You can do this from the keyboard with FN key and those function keys. The ThinkPad 300 also has it, as I'm 99% certain they use the same components inside. If someone has one, do confirm or rebuke this in the comments, please, as that's what they're there for. You can also get into setup from anywhere by pressing the setup key next to the turbo keys and FN, obviously, given it's a secondary function of a function key, but... Yeah, there's a few things to change in there, like LCD scaling and whatnot. I don't know. You don't need to go in there, really. Disk detection's automatic and that on it. I don't know what the... Well, I think the limit is about 500 megabytes or something, but... It, it don't, you don't need more than that on something like this. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's not a nice keyboard, I'm sorry. Still, ThinkPad also has the LCD. They just moved it. Oh, and the screen seems to be less adjustable with potentiometers than mine, but uh, what would I know? Funny, though, to think that we sort of have a white ThinkPad. With all of this said, it's not a terrible laptop by any stretch. It's okay. It gets the job done. It performs well. It would definitely be capable of running Windows with a little bit more RAM. Probably 95 at a stretch if you wanted to, with it fully upgraded, with all the RAM. It would honestly run most any normal application from 1992, certainly in Windows 3.1, without an incident. I'd go so far as to say it'd do it pretty damn well. But it has nothing to keep me coming back or keep me interested. I find myself reaching for the T3200SX, which is a slower and less capable machine, far more often than this, as it just has a nicer feel to using it and more character to it. It's just a better machine, really. Otherwise, I'd go for the Satellite or the Armada, which aren't really that far to compare with this, as they're later and way more capable, but even for doing the same job, they just offer a much better experience. So I don't know. Underwhelming, I think, is the word of the day. It's a bit of a mixed bag. It's a laptop that history probably won't remember, and I don't think that's unjustified, but it doesn't do anything majorly wrong that sets it apart from anything else, really. It's... It's just a laptop from 1992. There's not really much else to say about it, and that's a shame, because that means it's no longer a Zenith. It doesn't have the magic that Zenith machines used to have. Seems like that's dwindling now, and I don't really think it would stay with them for much longer. But I rest my case. I think I'm done with this one now. It's back to that jerk in front of the camera. Oh, if I ever happen to be in the same room as him at the same time, I am going to punch him in the fucking face. So that was the bastard. It's a competent laptop. It's pretty average, isn't it? It just comes off as a 386SL laptop with cash. You can replace it with any other one, no enough. And any other sort of not particularly well or particularly badly, just middle of the road. 25 MHz 386 laptop with cash. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> it's, it's just boring. So yeah, it's lost the Zenith magic. Doesn't have it. has little trace elements of it left, but it's gone. And that's sad, you know. I think there's, they, they pretty much disappeared out of my country after this. Uh, I think it was the last time BT used them. I don't know that for a fact. And I heard the later stuff was bloody awful, so... <laughs> I don't know that for a fact either. 
I don't want that bothered. Not too interested in finding out, but maybe this. Maybe it's not. It could be either. If you're in the market for this sort of laptop and you see one going really cheap, and of course if you're willing to deal with the sort of problems that you will face, getting a 30 year old laptop, uh, I'd say get it if the price is right, if it's something you want. But I do find myself using my T3200 more. And I use that Armada a hell of a lot. I've been writing another book. Uh, I want to write more, definitely. You know, I've, I've never sort of finished the first few drafts of another book uh, on that Armada. That, that thing kicks ass. It really does. Uh, you'll never see technological acceleration like that again in our lifetimes, I don't think. It's really, the last time you probably see me while my age is still a power of two. I could probably pull off one more of those. I don't think I can go for another one after that. Try. I think that's a bit of a reach. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. On the note of things uh, having a lifespan, the channel. I think we've known for a very long time this is coming, haven't we? And I'm not going to disrespect you by bullshitting you. Uh, this is winding down. This is, I'm, I'm running out of PCs. I'm not going to just sit here and repeat myself over and over again. Oh, let's just look at that machine again. Let's look at that again. You know, yeah, you might get the odd system update or something like in brief because I'm not just going to sit and repeat shit. I respect you too much to insult you in that way. I'm not going to do it. And I have too much respect for myself to lower myself to that level. I'm not, not going to do it. I'm not doing the whole... I found a new 486 in 2023, or this PC hasn't been powered on in 20 years. Fucking patronising shite. You're not going to see that here. But I'm not going to go away. I'll always do some computer stuff from time to time. Don't have a catch card now. So that's that's out the window, because I'm not, I'm not spending hundreds on new one. I got a Chinese one that died within a week. They always do them shit little USB things, so I won't waste my time on that. So any capturing is going to have to be done on the Win TV celebrity for as long as that lives. Uh, next video then, either going to be a synth demo, and my Prezler's broken, so I'll probably have to just dig up a random machine to do that. Uh, need to get that done before the year's over, one way or another. Or, if all goes to plan, the actual next one should be a 24-hour clock I built. All transistors and diodes. No microchips, in the power supply, no, no voltage regulator, uses 1950s style logic and electronics. And you know, that's not a computer video, but as a heck of a lot of computing principles went into the design. Because I will tease you as much as you're probably seeing a little bit of footage of it under test when I was building it. And it uses less transistors than the designs I've seen, it counts 24 hours. And uh, doesn't need uh, a decoder at the end to run the display either, but it does use principles like multiplexing, uh, a backplane bus, and you need the multiplexing to fit it on that, that smaller number of tracks. It uses things like uh, RAM access, same principles, and uh, ROM access. So there are computing principles in there, so they're pretty obscure now the way things are achieved, so uh, might actually be more interesting than you think. But, if this kills my channel, then so be it. It's a channel, which started as a jerk in college, lived a lot longer than I thought, and if people came here for just the one thing, you know, you oh, I just want PCs endlessly, and you don't want to stick around, see where it goes, you know, tolerate the other stuff with the PC stuff in between, and you just want to fuck off and find something else to, I won't hold that against you. I understand that, you know? That's, that's absolutely fine by me. I've got nothing invested in this, but my own entertainment and having a good time, and hopefully you had a good time as well. But it's just the way things are. Now, yeah, you know, do find it strange. I'm quite happy to just talk about it now. I don't care how many people I piss off or anything. I still find it very strange how my channel's as small as it is. This channel should be a lot bigger than it is for how long it's been here. And if I may say, the quality of videos that I put out, like maybe not so much now, not with this one, because all my shit's broken and I'm just past carring, but 
for the, the standard that was here, this should have been a lot larger. I have seen channels come and go, and they appear, and they just get to this massive size, and I have outlived all of them, but why, you know? Something funnier, because my channel's old enough now where I have a lot of demographic data, and you look back there, and what was significant was a lot of channels taken off around that time, and there's this, this bloody avalanche happens. Really funny that, isn't it? You fucked up on that one, boys, because it sticks out like a sore fucking thumb. What's that about? I feel like I've been screwed here. And I don't think this is just me. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who, if your channel's as old as mine, you'll see the same thing. Or otherwise you'll just get the flat line that I get now. If, you know, if your channel's newer than mine, it don't go back that far. Uh, something ain't right there. <laughs> so, so much wrong with the system there. It's, it's blazingly obvious. I mean, I don't think I'm going out too far, and if it pisses you off, it might, but I, I, I don't care. To say, you know, most of these people who did get a lot bigger, they're a bunch of fucking morons, to be honest. And they don't deserve it. I deserve it. I'm fucking better than them. And most of you that I speak to, you share my opinion that these people are a bunch of fucking morons. I'm a fucking moron. But I'm not as much a moron as them. I at least know when something's fucking broken. <laughs> there's, there's something fucking not right here. Something really not right. As it happens, whoever implemented that, you, you did me a favour. Because if I had like hundreds of thousands of bloody people watching, I'd have chucked this in the bin years ago. Do you think I'm insane? I'm not that crazy. I'm not interested in that. But I will point things out when I notice them, and I sure as shit notice that. And it's steady growth up to that point, and we just saw the almost the flat line after that. It's very sort of very strange, very very strange. Curious how that works. Curious it does make you wonder, doesn't it? it? Does make you wonder what's going on there? Probably monetary reasons for it. Probably. We'll tell ourselves that. Thing is, I mean, uh, you know, it's not going to invest in this, and I'm not beholden to a, a network or anything, or or Google, anything like that. The, the only people I'm beholden to, the only people I'm accountable to, is me and God, whatever that might be, <laughs> and everyone else can fuck off because I'm not going to listen. I'm not interested. You know, no authority. Dirt car, and I lose nothing by walking away from this. In fact, I just gain time, so. I've had a good time. I've had a really good time. I hope you've had a good time as well. It's not over yet, but someday it will be. But until then, remember, I'm high treason, and don't be a screw up. Load DOS 622 it. Preferably preloaded on the compact flash card on another machine, because. Drives broken from the factory on these, apparently. But hey, it's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go for the fun. That's interesting. They are just rubber derms under here, but they're really stiff. You can see it wants to go sideways rather than down. I was at least expecting that they slide around as well. Oh, that's that's dodgy. That's really dodgy. So it is sort of... I don't know. Weird. I was at least expecting those upside down ones that Toshiba used to like to use around this time, but... I guess not. They're just stiff, re st the stiff regular domes. How peculiar. Oh well. And you, you're thinking I forgot some of aren't you? The camera's pointing there now. I just wanted you to think that. I didn't forget. This laptop does something that is completely unforgivable. It doesn't have a fucking handle on it. How the fuck is it meant to be a portable machine if it doesn't have a fucking handle on it? Evidently that was starting to be a thing while the time this was made. I'd love to know who decided to take those off. I'd gladly fight you. I'd fucking fight you. 100, 150 quid to a charity of your fucking choice. 
says, I can knock you the fuck out for taking that fucking handle off. And if anyone else who runs a, a sort of old PC channel like mine wants to fucking fight over that or something else, it, yeah, let me know. I'll quite happily fucking do it. I've, I've, I've wanted that for years. You know, retro tech YouTube WWF would be fucking awesome. Uh, no one's going to do it, are they? <laughs> it's just wailing on a bunch of nards. It'd be so fun. I ain't got a laptop here. I just moved it. My video's over anyway.